invite you, Professor Muhammad Jami, to speak about how should Palestinians respond to Israeli trauma. Thank you. You build a wall, I'll build a bridge. You shoot at me, I'll kiss your bullet. You dehumanize me, and I will heal you when you are sick. Basically, when we are in conflict, the question is how to move on with our lives. We, we have been in this conflict for such a long time, and our problem has been that we do not know how to get out. We are digging deep in a hole, and the problem is how to get out of that hole. And uh, we look around, and it is walls in front of us. So how do we heal hatred? When I tried to heal hatred among Palestinians, I generated more hatred. And it's very interesting because the question is why? Why is it that by trying to understand the other, by trying to know about the other, by trying to find ways to educate children about a fact, a historic fact, a tragedy, yet people will not accept that. We live in the Middle East, and the Middle East is a barter community. You give me this, I'll give you that. You, you want to buy this, you have to haggle. And so anyway, this is part of our problem. And this is part of why this conflict is uh, unending. We look at each other and we don't see one another. We, we, uh, we don't hear the other. We do not want to look at the other. And this is part of the problem. And so when I started uh, with reconciliation and peace, I, uh, I didn't believe in reconciliation. I didn't believe in peace. I thought, I, I believe that it is either us or them. And so in this way, it is black and white. There is no middle. And yet, I was away for a long time. I, I was brought up in a family that actually did not advocate peace. It is the environment that caused us to do so. Yet, we, we live in this world together. And uh, unfortunately, it was my experiences that have helped me uh, find a way. I was born maybe a few, a few hundred meters from here in Bakam. Yet, in 1948, my family uh, was forced to leave East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem to go to East Jerusalem. And yet, my grandfather was a very wise man. He lost a lot. He lost his property, and he lost his home, and he lost his business. Yet, he did not uh, believe uh, in hatred. He did not believe in enmity. And then when his wife went to, buy, uh, to, uh, to a nearby Anirwa office to get a refugee card in order to uh, get food, he tore that card and he told her, I'm not a refugee. So he taught me a lesson that being a refugee is a state of mind. So in my diaspora, where I left Jerusalem to go to study at the American University of Beirut, and then the 1967 war started, and then I was caught in the, uh, in the environment of enmity and hatred and struggle in Lebanon, and I became a fedai in which to liberate Palestine. I had to get trained militarily, I had to believe that the other has no right, he does not exist, he has no history, he has no civilization. Yet, living there in that environment, I could see that 
there is no hope. And I found hope in education. So I went to the United States and studied there and got an MA and two PhDs. Yet education was not enough because as Plato has described to us, you can get out of the, of the cave, you can find the truth. The problem is, should you go back and teach that truth to others? Because, or should you stay out? Because going back to teach that truth to others, they will, you will be out of the, out, away from the group. You will not belong to the group anymore because you have the knowledge they don't. And so going back, that was part of a big decision I had to make. I was in the, in, in the United States. I was in an environment where next to me, there was an Israeli who was teaching Hebrew, and I was teaching Arabic. And yet, we never spoke to each other. We never communicated. And there was a big wall separating us. How do you heal this? I came back in 1993, and uh, it was on a family reunion that I came back. And uh, he took me to Twain uh, Karim, where he was having chemotherapy. And that was an eye-opener for me, because now I started to look at the other, at my enemy, and started to see a doctor, a nurse. And I saw that this doctor and this nurse was healing my father. <coughs> and, and not only my father, I look in the hospital and I see that these doctors and these nurses are healing others, Palestinians, their enemy. And so, to me, it was an eye-opener to the other. How does the, who is this other? Who is this enemy uh, who is healing my family, who is healing my people? At the same time, second experience that did awake me more was an experience with my mother where actually we, it was a Friday afternoon and then we, uh, she wanted to go to Tel Aviv and uh, we had dinner there and then going back she had a heart attack because she had an asthma and then the asthma, became, she fainted in the car and we were coming across to the uh, exit of Ben Gurion Hotel, Ben Gurion Airport and um, my brother who was driving decided to take that exit to the airport and I was against it because I felt the soldiers would not help. We are Arabs, we are Palestinians, we are Muslims, we are everything they, they are trained not to like. And so yet when we got to that exit, they were the ones who actually cleaned, uh, cleared the gate and then called in uh, emergency ambulance. And then I saw the doctors trying to heal also my mother. So basically, I thought, uh, how come that a man, a human being, that if you look at the other and you, uh, if you see the other as an enemy, then you dehumanize the other. However, when you look at the other from the human side, then you can see a human being, and th there the healing will start. There the enmity will, will come to a different, to a struggle, because within you, you will feel that you have, th there is a, a conflict within you. One says that the other is bad, and then the other says, no, the other is good. And in this way, the struggle becomes very acute, and you have to find a solution. You have to find a way to get out of it. So basically, with these personal experiences, taught me a big lesson. How to view the other, in terms of how to build a human being in front of you that you can see, that you can live with. And in this way, this is where it took me to, to be able to start working as a peace activist. And, uh, it was, uh, it was very important for me because uh, in this way, the good, the evil in the other brought out the evil in me. Yet the good in the other brought up the good in me. 
So when I when I look when I read about Jesus talking about the slap and if somebody hits you on the cheek and the other, to me it's the understanding that do not go to the level of evil to the other. Do not let the other uh, unleash the evil in you. Have control. And in this way, don't go down to his level, bring him up to your level. And this helped me actually just open my mind, just open my heart to the other. And uh, that was in 2011 that I was invited to go to Auschwitz. Uh, and it was, to me, it was an interesting experience. Why? Because I, I didn't know anything about Auschwitz before that. And even the things I knew that it was, uh, it was more a propaganda by Zionists and that this propaganda uh, aimed at uh, getting sympathy in order for Jews to invade my country, to get my homeland. And so that was, that was my impression before that. Yet, this visit in 2011 helped open my, my mind and my heart and the sense to see what was happening there and the reality of the tragedy and the depth of that tragedy. And also, it helped me to understand the psyche of the other. It was helped me understand how do the Jews look at the Holocaust and how do Palestinians look at the Holocaust. When a Jew looks at the Holocaust, he, when, a, when a Palestinian looks at the Holocaust, he looks at it from the small picture, from the picture of comparing the Holocaust with the Nakba. Because he lives in this victimization, that he is the victim, he is the only victim. There are no tragedies that has happened except the Nakba, 1948. So to him, that is the tragedy. And in this way, he looks at the post in Auschwitz, or he looks at the barbed wires, and he only sees his own uh, tragedy, his own Nakba. Uh, yet, he fails to understand how does the other look at the Holocaust and what does he see? And so, while the Palestinian looks at it and sees the small picture, the Jew looks at it and sees the big picture, that it was meant to annihilate the people, the civilization. Uh, just because they are Jews, nothing else. And in this way, the question was for me as, a, as an educator, how can I bring this big picture to the, to the Palestinians so that the Palestinians can understand how does the other, how does the other feel about the Holocaust? So, so that they, in denying the Holocaust, they can see that this is wrong and this is immoral, this, is, this defies history. And yet, I, I, it was very difficult. It was very difficult till now to help them understand the small picture and the big picture, and to help them, like in The Mockingbird, uh, how Harper Lee talks about uh, being in the shoes of the other and walking in that shoes. And so I wanted them to walk in the shoes of the Jews and see the Holocaust through the eyes of the Jews. And till now, it didn't work. It's very difficult for them uh, to, to be able to do that. Yet, I think we had had some breakthroughs in the sense that the Holocaust is not anymore a taboo topic. People are debating it. People are talking about it. People are saying, why is it that we should not, we should not learn about the Holocaust? And Many people, that is the problem that we have, which is reciprocity. People feel, if I want to learn about the Holocaust, they should learn about the Nakba. And this is wrong. And one of my students was telling me, why should we learn about the Holocaust if they make the Nakba illegal in their schools? My answer was just simple, because you will be doing the right thing. And this is, I think, the guide. This is the litmus test that we need to do. We should stop thinking in terms of reciprocity. I do not need to teach peace education only if the Israelis teach about peace education. I do not need to teach about reconciliation only if the Palestinians teach about reconciliation. 
we should drop this reciprocity idea, this this marketplace mentality of bargaining. I should do things because this is what should be done. I am working for reconciliation, not expecting that the Israelis or the Palestinians to understand what I'm doing now and or to just follow that. And as a result, people say that reconciliation should come post-conflict. Yeah, we have an agreement, we have, uh, we have uh, a peace, we sign it, and then we start to work on reconciliation. But that's totally wrong and in the sense, in, in, the idea, in, in this traditional idea that reconciliation comes in post-conflict. No, it should come now, it should come today. It should, uh, it should happen actually, not necessarily by lectures, by, by actions. And people ask me, uh, can you, can you, what do you expect us to do? And I say, in your post, don't dehumanize that. Just look at the other as a human being. Just deal with them. Yes, they are your occupiers. You are suffering from the occupation, but that should not stop you. Okay. Show empathy to their suffering, even if they are your occupier. Okay. And don't think of it in terms of we are the victims. No, because they are also victims. We are victims and we are perpetrators. And they are victims and they are perpetrators. And we both are in that way. In the sense that we, we have to realize that we have done something good, we have done something bad to each other. Yet let us focus on what is good. Let us focus on one, what brings us together. Let us focus on the values that we have. Now, this, this conflict is growing up to be also a religious conflict. Muslims against Jews and Jews against Muslims. And the Muslims are teaching uh, in, in their schools that the Jew is the enemy of God and the Christian is uh, an unbeliever. Well, this is not Islam. And uh, unfortunately, yet they are quoting the Prophet to say that on Judgment Day, we, there will be this battle in which Jews and Muslims will fight and then the Muslims will win and uh, a Jew will hide behind a tree or a stone and the stone will speak and say, come, there is a Jew behind me, come kill him. Which is nonsense. The Prophet would never have said that because it, it, it's totally contradictory to what the Quran says. And in this, trying to use the religion in order to address a political agenda, this is part of this conflict. And this is part where education plays a very big role where interfaith dialogue plays a role. Some people, they are teaching, for instance, that in the Quran it says that uh, the Quran describes Jews as pigs and monkeys, which is, uh, which is totally untrue. The Quran does say something to the effect that, uh, that, those, uh, that those who have broke the Sabbath, God had punished them to make them pigs and swine. But while it, that was not a generic statement, it was a punishment to those who broke the Sabbath. And so also the, the Talmud talks about the Ten Commandments actually calls people not to break the Sabbath. So uh, it's, it's not anti-Jew. And so, but taking it out of context and teaching our children that this is what Islam is all about, or this is what Islam is, this is also becoming part of our problem. And, and taking the Quran and misinterpreting the text and trying to teach that to our children is actually uh, part of why this problem is now taking a, big di a bigger dimension. We are inciting in our education against Jews, against uh, against also Israel. We are, we signed in Oslo that we recognize each other, yet we teach that Haifa and Yafa is part of Palestine. So they are teaching 
what they call national education, while we should be teaching peace education because we have recognized each other. And this idea, I will not recognize Israel as a Jewish state because I, unless they recognize me as a Palestinian state, it's also this idea of reciprocity is part of the problem because in 1947, the UN actually in the partition plan, it already did decide to have a Jewish state and an Arab state. So actually, it is part of history. If you look at this, oh, if you look at this conflict, you will tend to find a lot of those issues are non-issues. Whether it is Jerusalem, whether it is the refugees, whether it is the right of return, whether it is, they are just imaginary obstacles in our minds that will, actually if we make peace today, that we will look at them 20 years later, and like what we are doing today, when we cross from Germany to France, and we say, oh, it, there used to be a border here. Or when we talk about history, and we will say, oh, we fought against each other and we killed each other. Millions of people died in the Second World War, yet people have forgotten it. And we are, and we are in, 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 this, uh, uh, in this issue, yet we find as if our conflict is such a big conflict that it cannot be resolved. It will be, it can be resolved if we listen to the educators. And it will not be resolved if we listen to the politicians. Because the politicians want the status quo to remain the same because they are in power and they want to maintain that power. Yet, and they don't think in terms of the future. They think, think in terms of their everyday political situation. So basically, let me let me conclude with the story of an old man who was planting an olive tree, and this king passed by, and he said, old man, you are planting an olive tree. Do you expect that you will eat from the fruit of that olive tree? And the old man said, our grandparents planted, we ate. We plant so that our grandchildren will eat. Our problem is that we inherited from our grand parents this conflict. Now the question facing us, what do we want our grandchildren to inherit? Do we want them to inherit peace or do we want them to inherit this conflict? I know where reconciliation will lead. Reconciliation will lead to peace. But I don't know where hatred and enmity and violence will lead. That's the question I leave to you. Thank you very much.